We're going to be looking at some live pictures out of New York City at just after 5 o'clock Eastern Time. This is the scene in New York as thousands of people pour onto the streets in the midst of a massive power blackout in New York and across much of the eastern seaboard. Cities affected include Toronto, Ottawa, Cleveland, New York, of course, parts of New Jersey, Detroit, Toledo, Connecticut. Montreal still has power operating off the Quebec power grid, and we understand that there is no cutback in the Maritimes. We are hearing reports of a transformer fire at the Con Ed building on 14th Street in Manhattan. Con Ed is the huge New York power operating facility. And uh, New York's Mohawk Niagara power grid is also said to be overloaded. Officials say, this is a New York State Authority being quoted here, that there does not seem to be any link to terrorism. Again, the midst of a power blackout extending across much of the eastern seaboard. We'll be back in a few moments. All right, thank you, Lloyd. Again, the information that uh, almost everyone is waiting to hear concerns the cause of this, the suspicion or the fear that there could be terrorism at the root of it. That appears not to be the case at the moment. The mayor of New York City suggesting just a few minutes ago that the cause of this massive blackout across uh, Central and Eastern North America originates in Canada, possibly at the Niagara Mohawk power grid, and that the grid may in fact be overloaded. Of course, it's no uh, secret nor any surprise to Canadians that much of the power that fuels the industrial heartland of the United States, from the Ohio Valley all the way through to New York City, comes from our side of the border. So it certainly is plausible that any overloading of a massive grid, uh, like the uh, Niagara Mohawk grid, could in fact cause this power failure. So uh, to repeat, in case you're just joining us here at a couple minutes past 6 o'clock, uh, about 47 minutes ago, much of uh, eastern North America, the province of Ontario, the Ohio Valley, all the way through to New York City, struck by a massive power failure. The cities of Windsor, Toronto, Ottawa, and all points in between are affected. Millions of people are in the dark at rush hour, and that includes all of the people in those cars you just saw in New York City. There is gridlock on uh, the island of Manhattan, and of course, uh, there's also gridlock under Manhattan where the subway system has been shut down, and it would appear that many, many people are trapped in the cars there as well. In our own country, Parliament Hill is on backup power, and uh, the same goes for uh, almost all of the large public buildings uh, in southern, frankly, in all of the populated Ontario, southern uh, through eastern Ontario. So we'll have more on that as details develop during our news hour. And now to the other stories around the Maritimes. They fell from the sky and literally without warning. They're boulders, some as large as coffee tables. They smashed into a Halifax neighborhood this afternoon after being rocketed airborne by blasting in a nearby quarry. The residents say at least two boulders slammed into their building, narrowly missing a baby inside an apartment. ATV's Mark Petroni has more. The shaken residents of this Halifax apartment complex say they heard a huge blast around 1.30 this afternoon. At least two boulders hit their building. One went through the roof of the four-story complex and came crashing down into Tammy Wagner's third-floor apartment, the one she shares with her son. There was a huge bang, and then I could hear, like, crashing of glass or whatever and smashing, and I kind of dropped, and then I ran towards Alex. And Four-and-a-half-month-old Alex narrowly missed being hit. He was about 10 feet away in his swing. So, I mean, and it's right outside of his bedroom door. Like, we could have been coming out or I could have been going into the bathroom. Another boulder estimated at being the size of a coffee table smashed through this main floor window. Investigators believe the boulder came from that direction, then bounced on the parking lot where it made that indentation, bounced 18 meters further that way, and then crashed through the glass. Fire officials say the boulders came from the nearby Gateway Quarry on Kearney Lake Road. This site manager wouldn't give his name, but made it clear he doesn't know what went wrong. Man, I don't know what happened. I have no idea what happened. If I knew, I'd tell you, but I don't. You want me to make up a story? I can't. A total of three buildings were damaged. Also, uh, 27 Carrington sustained a, a hit where it went through a wall into a third floor apartment and happened to be a vacant apartment which was also very lucky. The Department of Environment and Labor is investigating no word on whether charges will be laid or who might face those charges. Now very late this afternoon Steve I spoke with uh, Mr. Frank Robinson who works for the company he told me that the company is uh, very concerned about what has taken place today he says that uh, health and safety remains the top priority 
and that they intend to take care of those affected by what happened today, meaning that anybody who's in need of housing, uh, that sort of thing, uh, can look to the company and uh, potentially get some relief. That's the latest, Steve. Mark, thank you very much. You're welcome. ATV's Mark Petroni in Halifax tonight. And now returning to the top story, the large power failure we told you about just a moment ago. The word just in now from the United States Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC, is that the massive power failure that has struck New York City and other East Coast cities is not the work of terrorists. The power failures have been reported, as we've already told you, uh, all the way from Windsor, Ontario in the west through to uh, Ottawa in the east and in uh, the Ohio Valley in the western uh, area of the United States through to New York City. Uh, the outage, uh, the outage rather, apparently caused by a failure at a Manhattan power plant, which then destabilized the power grid as far as Canada. So that is the word from the United States Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC. All of the area in the uh, red area that you see here on this map now affected by this large power failure. We'll continue to follow this story as we continue with the news hour. Well, she says it was something like out of a movie. A Nova Scotia woman was driving over the Matagan River last night when the bridge gave way, plunging her and her car into the water. She wasn't injured, but the collapse there does raise the question of just how many of Nova Scotia's bridges are similarly unsafe. ATV's Lillian Au has more. This is what's left of Matagan River Bridge. Elisa Amar was about to cross a bridge yesterday afternoon when she noticed something was wrong. She decided to slow down, a decision that likely saved her life. All night long, I was thinking, oh my goodness, like if I'd gone faster, what would have happened? It could have been much worse. There's no brake marks, so which leads me to believe that uh, obviously she didn't have enough time to, to, to put the brakes on very hard, but uh, enough to slow her down and uh, to keep her from making it all the way down to the bottom here. She, she landed on the first uh, on the first embankment. Police are investigating reports that an 18-wheeler truck like this one had crossed the span moments before. There were no weight limitations on the bridge. An independent engineer has been called in to piece together what really happened. Residents like Neil Terrio says he's always been uneasy about crossing it. I never used to be, but you know, it's a 50-50 chance when you pass on a bridge down here now. So. It's like playing Russian roulette. <laughs> That's because this isn't the first bridge in the province to collapse. Shortly before the election, the provincial government announced a program to fix and replace some of the province's aging bridges. The Matagan River Bridge wasn't on the list of the province's five-year, $50 million bridge replacement program. That program only applied to bridges built before 1940. This bridge was built in 1965. It was last inspected in October. The Department of Transportation says there were no safety concerns with the bridge, but the MOA for the area says he's heard otherwise. I think there's uh, probably some concerns that have been raised by department staff, and I think uh, ultimately this government has a responsibility to reassure the people of Nova Scotia that the bridges in their community are safe to use. The province says it intends to put in a replacement bridge as soon as possible. Until then, motorists will have to use a detour. In Claire Lillian L, ATV News. A man is to appear in Ontario court next month charged with the murder of a former New Brunswick woman. 29-year-old Julie Ouellette Bernier, a married mother of two, is a former resident of Drummond. She was found dead in her Toronto area home on August the 4th, and her funeral was held this week in Drummond. The man charged in her death is 28-year-old Leo Dennis Peligia. The RCMP are now confirming that remains discovered on the outskirts of Dartmouth are human. They were unearthed on Tuesday afternoon behind a gravel pit near the intersection of highways 107 and 118. The investigators say it is too soon to determine the gender of the victim. Right now we have the anthropologists on scene with our members, our investigators, our forensic people. Again, sifting through what's been found and hopefully to, to try to retrieve more evidence, if you will, at that scene. Uh, when that's done uh, and her work's completed, We'll probably get ground search and rescue team in to basically do a search on their hands and knees. There is no word on how long the remains have been on the site. The police say the bones and some bits of clothing have been there for a long time. A 20th century convenience has propagated a 21st century crime. Almost 75 people have had their identity stolen, not to mention some money stolen, by a device attached to automated teller machines. As ATV's Jacqueline Foster has discovered, this scam is so clever, at least two police officers are among its victims. 
Miramichi police recently received complaints from two local branches of the Bank of Montreal with regard to customer frauds. The scam involves a device that is used to steal money from bank accounts. They attach a small unit to the front of an automated uh, bank machine that you typically put your, your bank card in to get cash. And uh, then they'll, they'll set up a small pinhole camera somewhere in the lobby to uh, allow them access to see what your PIN number is when you enter your PIN into the machine. The device is left on the machine for a few hours. Then, with the help of a laptop, that information is used to duplicate the cards. Money is then withdrawn from the bank accounts. Police say at least 50 customers in Miramichi, maybe more, have been affected. Another 23 cards are believed to have been cloned in Dalhousie, New Brunswick. We're finding out who has been, uh, what cards have been compromised. We're contacting the customers. We're reassuring them that the Bank of Montreal is going to cover any sort of uh, losses that may be uh, taking place during the, um, during the particular period of time that the cards were cloned. Police believe the device used at these bank machines came from Montreal and suspect it's part of organized crime. It's the first time such a scam has showed up in this area, although Halifax has been hit before. Well, we're still getting information out of the Montreal area with the, with the police there who are cooperating with us. Um, all they're willing to say at this point is that it is organized crime, and they do have a task force set up to, uh, to, to combat this. They've had a, a great deal of problems up there with, with the same type of problems. This scam may not be commonly known in the Maritimes, but it doesn't seem to come as a big surprise to those living in this area. No, not really. On the internet and everywhere you got these kind of people. It doesn't take all that great a genius to put up a machine like that. You can find how to do that kind of stuff easily anywhere. Well, nobody's pleased to hear that this type of thing is going on, especially in a smaller community like this. But at the same time, I guess it can happen anywhere. As police continue to investigate, they're warning ATM users to keep an eye out for machines that have something unusual attached to them. Otherwise, you could be left with no money in the bank. In Miramichi, Jacqueline Foster, ATV News. The church is called united, but there may be divisions in the pews following a decision to endorse gay marriage. The United Church of Canada's General Council meeting in Wolfville has approved same-sex marriages, even over the objection of some of its three million members. ATV's Mike Cameron has reaction tonight. That if the, court votes in favor the debate of took less than an hour. The vote was overwhelmingly in favor of asking Ottawa to give legal recognition to same-sex marriage. I think that it is very important for the United Church of Canada to stand up and be counted. Carl Tricky married James Crooks in the United Church back in 1996. He says this week's vote is a logical step. I don't think that the United Church of Canada sees this as a as so much as a religious issue as they see it as an equality issue. And I believe that they are very strong advocates for equality of all people within the United Church. As the parliamentary vote on same-sex marriage draws near, most major religious denominations are debating the issue. Some say it has the potential to divide congregations. Glenn McAllister is a vocal opponent of same-sex marriage. He says there will be consequences for churches that support it. Uh, their attendance levels will decrease. Um, and I think that the churches where you uh, see that they're standing for truth and righteousness, I think that uh, um, and value a higher level of dignity for human life, I think you'll see those churches grow. But this United Church minister yes. says the church survived debates in the 1980s over the ordination of gays and it will survive again. And certainly there were some divisions and, and going, but there's also been a lot of healing since 1988 in Quebec. And I don't think that we're anywhere near that kind of thing. We have cast the stone, we have taken our stand, and this is just one more step along that pathway. While the United Church General Council is endorsing same-sex marriage, the decision whether to perform the ceremonies will still be left with individual churches and ministers. In St. John, Mike Cameron, ATV News. A new job for a familiar face to tell you about tonight. Defeated New Brunswick Conservative Cabinet Minister Rod Weston from the St. Martins area is to be Premier Bernard Lord's new Chief of Staff. He will replace David McLaughlin, who is likely to end up running a government department as a Deputy Minister. Mr. Weston, the former MLA for St. John Fundy, was Minister of Agriculture in the last government. We are set to return to CTV's National News Center, where Lloyd Robertson will bring us the very latest on the large power failure that is now affecting a large portion of North America, from as far as Ontario, western Ontario, the city of Windsor, all the way through to Ottawa in the east. New York City is also involved, as is Toronto, and that is where we will go now for the latest from Lloyd.
a CTV News Bulletin. Good afternoon. We are experiencing a massive power outage throughout the eastern seaboard of Canada and the United States. Cities affected include Toronto, Ottawa, Cleveland, New York, Detroit, Toledo, areas of Connecticut, parts of New Jersey. Montreal still has power, we understand. Uh, the Canadian Maritime still has power. So what we're looking at here is an area, uh, something like a square box extending northeast, including these cities we're looking at right now. Down in Chicago, they have power. Uh, it's expected that what's happening here, the reports we're receiving, is that um, the Con Ed station in New York State is involved. Uh, the Niagara Mohawk station has a power outage. Uh, we're not just sure what the source of the problem is at this stage. The pictures we're looking at right now are coming from New York City, live pictures, traffic jams in the streets. You can imagine people pouring out of the subways at this hour. Those who can get out are getting out. Airports are closed in all of these cities, uh, simply shut down. There is no power. Uh, people are pouring out into the streets. It's a hot day, a very nice day, in fact, in uh, most of this area. But uh, that could be one of the reasons for this problem. Um, naturally, many, many people are concerned about terrorism. We have had a word from the New York State Authority, and all they're saying on that point is that they are saying it is not terrorist-related. Repeat, it is not terrorist-related. This is some kind of technical problem, and you may be able to tell from my surroundings here that we have no power in this studio anyway. Uh, so we are broadcasting to those who can receive us at this time. Obviously, that's not in the uh, Toronto, Ottawa area, but those in Montreal can receive the picture. So this is a massive blackout in a largely populated area of Canada and the United States. And we'll continue to watch some of these live pictures coming to us um, from New York. Uh, with me on the line from London, Ontario, is David Drinkwalter, who is the former chief economist with Ontario Hydro. Good afternoon, Mr. Drinkwalter. I take it that London, Ontario is one of the areas affected here. You have no power either. No, absolutely none. Now, from what you've heard of what, uh, I know that you, you weren't able to get any television or radio uh, where, you're, where you're located, but from what you've heard, from what I've been reporting and uh, from what other sources are telling you, uh, what would you speculate might be the reason for this if it is, in fact, technically related? Well, it's a, um, a major station. Um, it would appear that this, uh, I guess, I, I, let me back up just for a minute. Electricity is a very alive system and must be balanced. And there are two things that can put that out of balance. One is a major loss of transmission, so all of a sudden you've got a lot of generators putting power out and far in excess of what's being taken. And then you've got uh, an imbalance in the system and the system will crash unless you can balance it very quickly. The other is if you have generation coming on and you've had a major failure at a station, so it's unable to put power in, you've got the major draw of power, now suddenly you're not able to provide it, and the system will crash. It will be one of those two. There are two events that come to mind in thinking about this. One in 1965 that was equally widespread, and that's because that area that is out at the moment is an integrated network. So if something happens in New York, it will have impacts here in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, in 1965, it was a problem with a relay at Niagara Falls. The other one was the ice storm that hit Quebec, um, was that three or four years ago? Right. Because Quebec isn't integrated. Quebec sells directly into other territories, such as Ontario and New York. When they went down, though, there was a, some connection with Ontario, but we had time to, to isolate Ontario from it so that this could have happened as a result of the ice storm. Transmission comes down, all of a sudden you've lost that load. So it's, it's quite possible as a technical problem, and it will take uh, some time to get it back on. This isn't a, a situation when you've got this kind of territory out of power. You have to bring it on slowly and balance the generation with the load. Right now, there are a lot of light switches that are still on. So you bring on a little bit of power, the system will crash again. So it'll be several hours before the system is back up. Uh, that's my speculation. Right. Well, that's uh, the best speculation we can get, I tell you, because uh, you uh, know all about this. Uh, what's your uh, best guess as to when power may start coming back on stream? Uh, 
if it is a transformer problem, they will be able to run some of the water-powered stations and get power up in some small isolated areas uh, and then feed the system from there uh, back off as some of the big steam plants come on. I would uh, speculate that uh, you will have a small audience in the morning. I don't think that we'll be back on in this territory within 24 hours. Really? Well, that is something. 24 hours is a possibility before everything is back uh, on stream. Well, uh, not, not anything, but before we're back up to where we were before the Right, happened. okay, we should qualify that. It'll start, it, it'll start coming back earlier, but not up to full power again before no, the morning. It'll come back in, in pockets, and I would... I'd be surprised if by noon tomorrow we're back up to where we were. This Isn't can take a long period of time. That is amazing. And if um, somebody has the research there to look at the 1965 uh, power outage uh, and find out how long it took to get it back up, that might be the best guide. But I suspect, from my knowledge of the system, it will be several hours. Mr. Drinkwater, would you stay with us, please, because uh, we appreciate uh, your... I have your... very little else to do. <laughs> that's right. There's not anything anybody can do at this stage. That's nope. true. So uh, you stay with us, and we're going to uh, switch over to Steve Chow, uh, who is uh, in downtown Toronto. We're not looking at Toronto pictures here. We're looking at New York again live. Now, that may be the smoke coming from the Con Ed building we told you about. Uh, it was said to be shut down. There was um, an earlier report that there was a fire at the Coronet building, and then uh, the New York State Authority said, no, uh, not a fire. There was a shutdown, um, and uh, the shutdown or the fire may have been the result of the shutdown. That's uh, as it came to be. Um, and as uh, was explained by Mr. Drinkwalter, uh, if these two major areas, these two major stations, um, are causing a problem, this could affect this wide area we're talking about here. Um, Montreal is on stream because uh, that's fed from the Quebec power grid. Uh, the Maritimes is still on stream, that too, uh, fed by Quebec. But Toronto, Ottawa, Cleveland, New York, Detroit, Toledo, areas of Connecticut, uh, parts of New Jersey, all without power at this hour. As we look at these live pictures, people crawling along the streets of uh, Toronto here in their cars uh, because uh, that's one place where you can get out and at least talk to people. Thank goodness it's a, it's a good enough, bright enough day here because uh, this makes uh, this kind of activity a little more pleasant than it might otherwise be. There is concern, naturally, about the people who are in the subways and who are trying to get out of those subways and how that problem is being dealt with. Steve Chow from our CTV Toronto Bureau may have something to say about that. Steve, uh, just uh, come in as best you can and uh, tell us about that. As you were mentioning, a lot of the people are trying to get out of this. From our understanding at this point, uh, electricity is not running in the subway, so people are trapped in between stations, and it's pretty hot down there. The air conditioning, of course, is not working, and, and crews are rapidly trying to get people out um, of the underground. Uh, on the surface, however, it does not look that bad. It almost looks like a bad rush hour day, but then you look upwards at the traffic lights and you realize something is seriously wrong. As well, you look at the streetcars that rely on electricity here, and they, of course, are stopped. We've been walking through the streets of downtown Toronto in the last uh, few minutes, and most of the stores at this point are closed. The fear, obviously, is, uh, is looting uh, due to the lack of electricity. A lot of the security card passes in many buildings, of course, are not working, which means that all the doors are wide open. So security is a major concern. But saying that, it looks like people are pretty uh, peaceful, taking everything in stride at this point. Everyone's calm, saying it's a bright, sunny day. Might as well stay outdoors and enjoy it while they can, because they don't know how long the electricity will be out for, which uh, means it could be a long night. Yeah, Steve, don't run away, because uh, I just want to interrupt uh, your flow of uh, commentary here to indicate that we have... Um Something that seems to be pretty authoritative now about the cause of this, uh, this comes from the Reuters News Agency, quoting sources from Washington, saying that the outage was caused by a Manhattan power plant which destabilized the power grid as far as Canada. Federal Agency Regulatory Commission spokesman Brian Lee is, quoting as, is quoted as saying that. Uh, he also says, we have no indication that there is any terrorism involved. The thinking is, he says, that a fire at a generating plant in Manhattan destabilized this big grid, which cascaded up the grid and took a loop around the Great Lakes 
into Canada. So once again, we're back talking about that uh, fire that was first mentioned about an hour ago as being the possible cause of that. Uh, then that was, uh, the speculation about that was doused, if I may put it that way. And then, um, again, now it looks as though this is being pointed to as the cause of this blackout. Uh, Steve, give us uh, just a little bit of the uh, human touch down there. You've been talking to people. What are they saying about this? Uh, are they uh, asking questions? Are they talking to one another? How are they behaving out there? Well, Lloyd, when the power first went out here in Toronto, there was, of course, this this deep sense of worry about what was happening. Um, many people referred back to September 11th, the fear that perhaps there was uh, some insidious motive uh, behind what had happened. Um, news is slowly getting out right now on the streets um, from the radios and people's cars about what the possible, possible cause is of this. And so there is a growing sense of relief to the sense that this may be uh, a result of, um, of the power plant and the troubles in, in the United States. People are trying to remain as calm as possible, but saying that as well, as soon as the lights went out, a lot of people uh, began reaching for their cell phones to call loved ones. A lot of people very emotional, of course, wanting to make sure their loved ones are okay. A lot of people here uh, are trying to stay out of their vehicles as well because they don't imagine they can get out in the suburbs anytime soon. That's because, of course, the traffic lights uh, throughout uh, Toronto are down and uh, the streets are a little bit of a mess at this point. All right, Steve, stay with us. We... Uh can tell those of you watching us who are able to watch us that uh, we don't have any cameras operating out there for perhaps obvious reasons, um, but uh, because we, ha we don't have anything to plug them into that will work. But uh, we do have telephones, of course, and Steve is talking to us on the phone, as is David Drinkwalter, who is the former chairman of, um, former chief economist, I should say, former chief economist of Ontario Hydro, and he is still on the line with us. And uh, I'd like to go back to uh, what we would say is the news of the moment here Mr. Drinkwalter, that um, the report from Washington, from Reuters News Agency, indicating that the outage was caused by a Manhattan power plant, which destabilized the power grid as far as Canada. Uh, this uh, person quoted here is spokesman for the agency, Brian Lee. He says, we have no indication that there is any terrorism involved. A massive power outage left sections of New York, Detroit, Cleveland without electricity. Outage also brought... Um, two major Canadian eastern cities, Toronto and Ottawa, to a standstill today. Montreal is still on stream because of its uh, own power grid. Uh, and now this is another quote from Mr. Lee. He is saying, the thinking is that a fire at a generating plant in Manhattan destabilized the grid, which cascaded up the grid and took a loop around the Great Lakes into Canada. Uh, now this Con Ed facility is on the 14th Street in Manhattan. So uh, what's your response to, uh, to this, Mr. Drinkwalter? Would um, a fire in a facility like that um, possibly be the cause of something like this? So this is the best information we seem to have oh, at this point. Absolutely. We are tied to that whole territory is tied into something that used to be called the Northeastern Power Pool. I don't know whether they've changed the name or not, but we're all integrated. And as I said previously, here you've got a situation where the, you've got large demands on a day like this in particular, but at the peak period, you've got a large demand for electricity and suddenly a major supply point disappears. This fire would do it, would take that generating station off. Then the system drags itself down because it's trying to find power to satisfy all of these current customers and it can't do it. So the system will cascade and ultimately we're all gone. And it's not just the major cities, it's everybody in between. I sit here in London, Ontario, west of Toronto, but I suspect that you would go to small towns like Tilsonburg and Aylmer and so on in between, and nobody has power. Right. Now, um, one wonders how a fire could get that far in a power plant and cause this kind of a huge problem without being noticed or without being controlled sooner. How could that happen? Oh, I, I, I don't know the nature of the fire, so I can't speculate, but if you get a fire, and you have to take a unit off the system, that's all it takes. It's the same as a, a system breakdown, a, a generation, um, a generator that breaks down or a problem in the boiler. It need not be a fire. But they, the real issue here in terms of the blackout isn't whether it's a fire or something else, it's that they had to take those units off the system and they, they didn't have, obviously this is a major supply point because there weren't sufficient immediate operating reserves to uh, to offset it so it just dragged the system down
It has a they, kind of the real issue then, here is it? that they were forced to take that generating station off the system so that its supply was cut off. And then you have a kind of domino effect. Yep. Because there just isn't the supply there. Now, um, one more question before we bring in uh, Joy Melbourne in from Ottawa. Um, uh, just one more question for Mr. Drinkwater, if I may. I'm getting other instructions there, but I wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, could this have been caused by, um, I don't know, we have the fire as the actual source, but could this have been caused by overheating in power plants as a result of the excessive heat we've had these last few days and the use of air conditioning systems? Uh, not likely at the generating station. If this had been a transformer station, then I would say yes, it's been caused by an overload at that station. They're trying to put too much power through it in the hot weather, but unlikely at a generating station. All right, Mr. Drinkwalder, again, we ask you to uh, please stay with us because we appreciate your expertise and we'll be calling on you later. And as we have people tuning in, we will want to uh, update this story for them as time goes on here. Uh, Linda Sims, uh, CTV Business Editor, is at the Toronto Stock Exchange where there can't be very much activity going on right now, although we do see the board crawling there behind you, Linda. Does that... Well that's right, Lloyd. Uh, it turns out that we are battery-powered here right in the broadcast center. But I can tell you that the rent of the exchange tower is in darkness, as are most of the major buildings in the downtown area. Any lights that are on are battery-operated right now. Now, what are people there saying about this? What do they know? What are they hearing about it? Well, uh, we are able to still get the Internet. Uh, we're glad for that and able to get the news updates. Um, and so we are hearing about the fire that appeared to uh, start in the Con Ed building in Manhattan. Uh, and we're also hearing, as you have been, about just how widespread this is. Here in downtown Toronto, we do not have the streetcars running on the main streets downtown. We've got absolute gridlock on, on the streets because the traffic lights are out. However, uh, Canadians uh, here, the Torontonians being a pretty polite people, one fellow who came in said that everybody's taking their turn as if it, uh, they are all four-way stop signs. We also hear that the subways are not running. What I cannot confirm is whether or not there's anyone actually trapped in subway cars in the system. Now, uh, obviously, Linda, when this story broke uh, this afternoon and uh, it was, it was uh, um, concluded that uh, it was not terrorism, right. uh, there was a great sigh of relief. But prior to that, uh, were people beginning to empty the office buildings? Uh, oh, was absolutely. All over the place, right? That's right. A number of the buildings in the downtown area were evacuated between 4.15 and 4.30 Eastern Time this afternoon. Um, and uh, this building itself, the Exchange Tower, at first security told us that we should evacuate, and then they decided about five minutes later that uh, we did not have to, which is why we are still here. But uh, there's no doubt that that was the first conclusion that people jumped to, that this must be some kind of sabotage. If not a terrorist attack, then perhaps the worm, uh, the computer worm that we've been hearing about operating in some way that we, uh, we couldn't quite figure out yet. So quite a bit of confusion. And what you saw on the streets was just people streaming into the streets trying to figure out what was happening, shop owners walking out and, and looking around. Of course, everybody at first thinking it was only their own TV or their own lights having gone out until they realized and started to understand the magnitude of this. Uh, as you're speaking, Linda, we're showing pictures from uh, New York City. Uh, masses and masses of people out on the streets because uh, they're that's where they're getting their information from one right. another at this particular point. Um, Linda, we're now uh, getting some informed speculation that the stock, that the total power grid may not be back in full operation until tomorrow morning. Now, what's this going to do to uh, economic matters at the Toronto Stock Exchange in the meantime? Well, actually, uh, it, hopefully the effect will be minimal. The power outage did not occur until after the exchanges in both Toronto and in New York uh, were closed for the day. I understand that they did evacuate the New York Stock Exchange, not taking uh, any, uh, any chances at all in New York. But it, it has uh, been very quiet on the markets, um, a lot of people on holidays, very light volume on the markets. And so if we can be up and running uh, by the time the markets are supposed to open at 9.30, tomorrow morning, then uh, it should be all systems go. All right, uh, Linda, thank you very much. Uh, I know you'll be standing by for us in downtown Toronto because we at least get a picture from you and we appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> I know they're hard to come by. They bye are bye. indeed. Linda Sims at the Toronto Stock Exchange, a C2E business editor. Joy Melbourne is in Ottawa where the power also went out this afternoon. In fact, uh, that's the first place we called from here and we heard right away that uh, Ottawa was out of power. Uh, Joy, what's the response there?
well, Lloyd, you're seeing me because our brilliant engineers have rigged up emergency generator power. Uh, what's happening here is what's happening all over Toronto. People downstairs, regular people directing traffic. Power went out on Parliament Hill. There was a band playing, and they didn't know the difference. Um, in the market, the Byward Market area, a lot of restaurants are closing down because the food is going bad. There's no power. But it's interesting. There's a big lineup down at the chip truck at the corner. <laughs> That's natural, isn't it? Um, now, of course, Parliament is not sitting at the moment. Are there any politicians around? Anybody uh, concerned that this might be something bigger than a power blackout? Uh, well, there's lots of politicians up there. In fact, I just interviewed the opposition leader, Stephen Harper, on, on another story. Um, they are concerned. We did hear recently that Ontario Hydro, a spokesperson, is being quoted uh, to the Globe and Mail that uh, power will be back tonight. So I guess everyone's keeping their fingers crossed. Well, uh, just uh, on that point, as a matter of fact, uh, one of our experts uh, who's uh, with us here, David Drinkwalter, who's the former chief economist with Ontario Hydro, he uh, is speculating that uh, we may not have everything back on stream until tomorrow morning, possibly until tomorrow noon. Now, he's talking about everything being back. Uh, you know, obviously, this will come back on in bits and pieces as we go through the evening and through the night. Uh, fortunately, this is happening in broad daylight uh, and that we are at that time of year when we can appreciate the extended hours of daylight and certainly appreciate that in this kind of very dismal situation. Uh, Joy, is there any uh, possibility that uh, there will be any meetings about this um, tonight in Ottawa, uh, pulling together uh, those concerned about hydro matters in uh, Toronto and Ottawa? Because hydro has been a subject, of course, um, that's uh, quite a contentious issue for the Ontario government. Oh, I'm sure the phone lines, which what phone lines are working, will be burning up. Um, I do know uh, that uh, Ottawa police are, are uh, uh, very concerned that people not drive. They're asking people to take public transit. A lot of people are, are, are lining up to, uh, to use the pay phones because they realize that their cell phones aren't, aren't working. But so far, I mean, everything seems to be very calm because I think, as you said, it is in daylight. It's not at night. So I, I think a lot of people are remaining calm. Yes, that uh, was one of the reasons uh, someone was speculating here earlier that uh, this um, is less likely a terrorist attack because terrorists, if uh, they were operating with this kind of uh, force, would perhaps want to do this uh, at night, uh, not in broad daylight. Uh, thank you very much, Joy. Joy Melbourne in Ottawa, you continue standing by for us. Now, just to bring you uh, up to date once again as to exactly what's going on here, we have a massive power outage throughout the eastern parts, uh, eastern seaboard, of Canada and the United States. Uh, the cities affected include Toronto, Cleveland, New York City, uh, parts of uh, New Jersey, Detroit, Toledo, and areas of Connecticut. Montreal still has power off the Quebec power grid, and the Maritimes also still has power. The Atlantic uh, region of this country has power, and of course, uh, nothing affected in the West. In fact, uh, if we were to draw a square there, a slanted square, uh, right over those cities, that is the area affected. Of course, it is a massive population center, but uh, it's, effect, um, it's affected because of this uh, fire at the Con Ed station in New York. Now, it's pretty well determined at this stage that that is the reason for the power blackout. In fact, I'll read to you something we uh, quoted just a moment ago. Uh, this was uh, for a couple of minutes ago, actually, that U.S. power regulators say that a massive power outage that hit New York City and other cities in eastern United States and Canada was not caused by a terror attack. That's the good news here. The outage was caused by uh, a Ma Manhattan power plant, which destabilized the power grid as far as Canada. And this comes from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, the thinking is, according to a man by the name of Brian Lee, the thinking is that a fire at a generating plant in Manhattan destabilized the grid, which cascaded up the grid and took a loop around the Great Lakes and off into Canada. Uh, this uh, source is reported to be the Con Ed facility, the Con Edison facility on 14th Street in Manhattan, and that affected everything else in this territory. Obviously, this is affecting transportation, both uh, in the cities and uh, at the airports throughout uh, the eastern parts of Canada and the United States. Uh, we understand that uh, the Toronto airport uh, hasn't been functioning for uh, the better part of an hour and a half now. We have a gentleman on the line for us, uh, P Peter Gregg, who is uh, with the Toronto Airport Authority. Good afternoon, Mr. Gregg. Good afternoon, Lloyd. So uh, what's happening out there? 
Well, actually, we, we are operational. Um, we've got all the necessary backup power to keep the safety systems and, and essential operating systems going. But at this time, air traffic control is not launching any departing flights. We're taking arriving flights uh, destined for Toronto only. So are you operating a kind of backup power with airport control then for arriving flights? Yes, we are, exactly. And we're able to keep air traffic control going. We're able to keep, um, uh, if we get into the evening, we're able to keep um, the, uh, the runway lights uh, operational as well. Now what about the actual power within the airport itself? Are, are, uh, are you able to cover all the lights off with this emergency we're system, or is it dim and dull? No, it's, um, we're able to keep um, any essential light safety support and operational system going. So we're able to, uh, to keep the, the terminals um, obviously inhabitable, um, but uh, certain systems that are non-essential, we do have to shut down. We don't have enough uh, backup, backup power to power every, every single uh, electrical uh, component of the airport. Now this, uh, as we know, is a peak travel season. Obviously there were a lot of people in the airport today. How crowded was it when this happened late this afternoon? It, 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 August is a peak time. A lot of people are on vacation. Um, and obviously with business travel, um, it's, it's uh, a busy time, sort of the end of the day. But uh, we're trying to get the message out to anybody in Toronto trying to come to uh, Pearson Airport for a departing aircraft to, uh, uh, to not come to the airport. There's no point in trying to get through traffic to get here because departing flights simply are, are not leaving. Well, that is a bit of a problem, getting the message out, because uh, we know that we're not being heard in, uh, in our central area here, uh, certainly around our building in Toronto. But uh, we know that it is going out to uh, parts of the rest of the country, and hopefully they will talk to people in Toronto and get the message out that this is not a terrorist activity, but uh, it is um, something else. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, a technical problem originating at the Con Ed facility in New York. Now, when this happened at the airport, uh, were people fairly calm? Was there concern about a terrorist attack, first off? No, we, did, we certainly didn't see any panic. I think people were calm. People were calm here operationally, but also in the terminal buildings. Um, I, I'm sure people's minds go to that, um, but it was, uh, I think, a fairly, uh, fairly quickly we, we knew that it, it was not a terrorist activity. And I think uh, we're doing what we can with our people on the ground in the terminal buildings to make sure that, uh, that those people up there know that uh, this is not um, anything to worry about from a, from a terrorism uh, perspective. All right, Mr. Greg. Now, just once again, because you'd like to give some instructions to people, I'm sure, who may be heading out to the airport for flights tonight or uh, meeting arriving planes coming in. What do you have to say to those people before we go? Well, uh, considering the traffic that's on the streets in Toronto and considering that we're not departing any aircraft here, I think the best thing to do is if anybody's planning on getting to the airport, the best thing is just to stay put and not come to the airport. Uh, the combination of the bad roads and flights not uh, leaving this, this place, it's just, just best to stay put, stay home. All right. Thank you, Mr. Greg. The situation at the Toronto airport, pretty calm, as uh, Mr. Gregg says, just to recap uh, what he's telling us. Uh, planes are landing, they're not taking off. There is backup power uh, in the airport control towers. There is backup power in the airport itself, so lights are on there. Uh, people are calm. Uh, they're milling about. Obviously, this is a heavy travel season, and it would seem that um, everything is, uh, is uh, calm enough at the airport that uh, activities can proceed apace. Uh, let me just um, give you some information about what's happening with the Toronto Transit Commission. Uh, operation shut down shortly after the outage, leaving transit officials surrounded by frazzled commuters asking for information. Um, people poured out onto the streets, many complaining that their cell phones were not working and they couldn't reach family members. Within about an hour of the outage, buses began to be routed along important routes to handle stranded citizens. Long lines of cars idled as motorists haphazardly tried to squeeze through intersections without traffic lights, and even when police officers were called in to direct traffic flow, they were often ignored by frazzled drivers and pedestrians. So obviously there's a lot of road rage out on the streets, and that is not helping anything at this hour, and that's a silly thing to be concerned about right now. This is when you uh, turn off, back off, and just uh, settle in to understand the fact that you're going to be where you are for a couple of hours because um, there is an emergency situation which we're all suffering from at this stage. Uh, stores at the Eaton Center along Toronto's famous Young Street were closed and locked down. Emergency generators powered the downtown St. Michael's Hospital for most procedures. Uh, uh, most procedures, though, were canceled to save power for only uh, the most serious cases. All outgoing flights from Pearson International Airport grounded, as we've said, but uh, the flights have been landing on backup power 
at airport control. Pentagon officials in the U.S. Uh, say the power breakdown was not the result of terrorism. That's uh, crossing the desk on a regular basis here, that point being emphasized. But no official in Canada or the United States could offer any explanation on their own. Uh, we have information, though, which uh, is um, being, uh, being confirmed by a couple of sources at this stage that uh, the source of it is the Con Ed facility on 14th Street in Manhattan. To quote uh, Brian Lee, he says, uh, from that facility, he says, the thinking is that a fire at a generating plant in Manhattan destabilized the grid, which cascaded up the grid and took a loop around the Great Lakes and into Canada. As we look at these live pictures from New York City, looking pretty calm at this hour, but lots of people out there on the streets, uh, a sea of people down near the water, and uh, some people obviously are trying to head home. Uh, one of the problems with this particular emergency is that uh, people are not able to make use of their cell phones as they might otherwise, so they're not able to contact loved ones to find out just what is going on or to transmit the information that they are fine where they are. Now we switch to Toronto, the source uh, of uh, the problem again. No, another point for the problem here today. Uh, this is videotape from uh, earlier, just a few moments ago. Uh, people moving along pretty calmly, as you can see, asking one another what might be going on. Uh, that was videotape. Now we're back to our live picture as we watch New York City. Uh, we heard very early on this afternoon that the New York Stock Exchange had closed down and uh, that immediately caused people to be concerned that there might be some kind of terrorist activity afoot. And that was lurking in the background of everyone's mind, everyone's concern here this afternoon. But we uh, got the message fairly quickly that uh, this was not that. It was, in fact, a technical problem, a major power blackout caused by a fire at the Con Ed facility at 14th Street in Manhattan. Reza Yurovani is uh, on the telephone. Once again, we're uh, operating by the good old reliable telephone today because uh, we can't get cameras in very many locations, and uh, where the cameras are, uh, quite frequently, they can't be plugged into anything. Uh, Reza Yurovani is um, a utility expert, uh, an expert, I take it, on things like power outages and the sort of experience uh, we're undergoing right now. Uh, Ms. Yurovani, thank you for joining us. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, Mr. Giovanni? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, nice to talk to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yes, uh, now I have to ask where you're located. I am basically in downtown Toronto at the University of Toronto. Okay, and uh, what's the scene around you there? Basically, we don't have any power except some emergency power in the buildings and traffic is really bad around here, but it is moving very All right, we can, uh, As we look at those pictures, we see some people um, just uh, simply taking the opportunity to uh, jump into water fountains and uh, use the big hoses at this point. Uh, so let me ask you um, about this problem that we seem to be uh, experiencing here, uh, the, the fire in the facility in uh, Con Ed building in New York State. Uh, what does that tell us about uh, the state of the facility there and how could something like this occur? In fact, uh, at the moment, I don't have any information, and I just hear it from you, but probably it could be an overload on the system. During basically heavy load hours, it could be that the generators are being pushed to the limit. And if there are other problems, of course, we do not expect the generators to experience fire. But if there are any other problems, heavy load can be a major contributor to the fire. Well, I was asking one of our experts uh, earlier just what uh, might have caused this fire. Would it be overload? Would it be uh, use of air conditioners? Uh, yes, excessive? Definitely. It could be an overload, yes. It could be an overload. Right. And uh, why wouldn't the fire have been brought under control earlier before it caused this kind of damage? In fact, uh, I don't have any explanation for that, that why it could not be brought under damage or why the problem has caused such a widespread blackout, if that is the reason. In fact, it shouldn't happen. No. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your welcome. input this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Urani, who is a utility expert from the University of Toronto. Uh, we're uh, watching pictures here, courtesy of WABC in New York, uh, people being taken out of transportation facilities in New York City, out of subways, out of um, 
subway cars. Uh, obviously, someone is down in the subway with a camera uh, near a platform, and you can see what's happening there, and people are obviously exhausted, very, very hot, because uh, they've been in there for, uh, one would imagine now, up to about an hour and a half in total darkness, uh, in steaming heat, uh, probably without uh, water or food, and in that kind of situation, um, people can become very faint and disoriented, so the medical facilities are about to go full bore in New York City in those uh, subway sections. Scott Laurie is with us. Uh, he's um, at downtown Toronto again. Uh, Scott, uh, what's happening where you are? Uh, Lloyd, I'm in the, in the lobby of a downtown hotel. I was um, on Toronto Island and was totally unaware that this was even going on until about uh, half an hour, 40 minutes ago, uh, took a ferry across the water on Lake Ontario to this uh, hotel. It was the nearest place that I could find where I could get some information. A lot of people in this hotel, uh, and a lot of them are crowded around a radio trying to get some information about what exactly is going on, and it's uh, basically total darkness in this hotel. Many people just sort of wandering around wondering what's going on. Are they calm? Yeah, most people are. Uh, I think a lot of people... Uh, that might have been leaving the hotel. We're trying to get to flights, which there were questions about whether flights are even even happening. I don't know if we have the answer to that. but uh, Well, we do. In fact, let me be the uh, conduit here and pass along some information. The airport authority is telling people not to bother going to the airport because no flights will be taking off as long as this blackout continues. And this blackout is expected to continue all evening, uh, well into the night and perhaps into tomorrow morning. It, the power will come back on gradually in various areas. Uh, but the power uh, in full may not be back on until tomorrow morning. So the airport authority is telling us that flights will uh, flights are landing because of backup airport control power, but uh, no flights are taking off from Pearson Airport at this hour. So you can pass that along to those people who are concerned. Anything else you'd like to know? Well, just, to, just to illustrate how people are trying to cope with this, uh, I was trying to make my way into the hotel and did, and was walking by the uh, money exchange, and business is is still going on there. They're using flashlights and candles, and you can barely, barely see in front of your face. But uh, things at this hotel are, are inching along, and it's, it's quite dark, and most people so far uh, are, are pretty calm. But it, it's kind of strange that this is happening. All right. Well, uh, we can emphasize once again, Scott, and you can tell the people there that uh, this is not about terrorism. Uh, it's uh, about a power outage originating at a facility in New York. Um, on 14th Street in Manhattan, in fact. It's a huge facility. There was a fire there at a generating plant, and uh, that had a domino effect in pulling the power away from other sources until the whole grid went out. Um, people here are remembering 1965, in fact, because that was the last big power outage through Ontario and parts of eastern New York. Uh, now, we are seeing a picture here. I'll just interrupt you, Scott, um, to hear Michael Bloomberg and uh, of he New York. is uh, pleased to inform us that power is starting to come back from the north and from the west. What that means is that we will be starting up power in the city. It will take a decent amount of time, hours, not minutes, and nobody really can be any more specific than that. The first thing that everybody should do is to understand that there is no evidence of any terrorism whatsoever. For some reason or other, there was a power failure in northern New York or southern Canada that cascaded down through the system and affected the power grid as far east as Connecticut, as far south as New Jersey, and as far west as Ohio. To the best of our knowledge, nobody has been injured during the evacuation procedure from tall buildings or from the subways. There are people who are still in the subways as of last report, but the police are t saying that the evacuation procedures are working, people are calm, and that they are getting out. A lot of people are inconvenienced, clearly. Most hospitals have power. One hospital does not, Downstate Hospital in Brooklyn. Uh, the police commissioner and the fire commissioner and the commissioner of uh, Deputy Commissioner for uh, Office of Emergency Management are all here. Uh, what they report in summary is a very quiet city. There are no fires of any size going on at the moment. 
There's no criminal activity of any size taking place or hasn't been reported. 911 is working, 311 is working. Uh, things like traffic lights are not working. The police department has uh, dispersed people to major intersections to try to help with traffic direction. Uh, the fire department and police department have called in all of their staff, those that had been on earlier and those that were scheduled to come on, so we are fully staffed. Our advice to people is to be very careful in going home. It is very hot out there. The water supply is safe and you should drink a lot of water. You should keep your refrigerator doors closed. You should open your windows. It is also important that you turn off all electrical appliances, particularly air conditioners, because as the power comes back, Con Ed and the other power companies will have a very difficult time if the demand is 100%. So by turning off your air conditioners, you will in fact help yourself get air conditioning a lot quicker. At the moment, people are doing what you would expect them to do in New York City. They're cooperating. And if you are walking and you feel the least bit faint, go into a police precinct, go into a firehouse, go into a restaurant, sit down, have some water, and just be sure that you don't make an inconvenience into a tragedy. Uh, at the moment, I've talked to, so you should know that I've talked to Andy Card, who is the President's Chief of Staff, and to Governor Pataki. Uh, both have offered aid, but there's nothing at the moment that we think they can uh, provide us with. We believe that our, uh, present, uh, our uh, internal capacity is adequate to maintain public safety and to uh, continue the process of recovery from a power failure. Uh, we've talked to the MTA. Uh, as I said, I've talked to Con Ed. Uh, everybody has been as helpful as you could possibly ask them to be. And uh, with a lot of luck, uh, later on this evening, uh, we will look back on this and say, where were you when the lights went out? But nobody will have gotten hurt. I think it's a fair statement to say that for most events that were planned tonight, the power will probably not be back in time, and I would assume that most people would cancel any events that they had planned. Be happy to take a question or two, sir. Who did? I'm sorry. An OEM spokesperson told CNN that there may have been a fire that may There was no fire whatsoever. My statement, uh, I believe, to is I believe to be correct. Uh, Gene McGrath, the chairman of the board of Con Ed, assures me that that smoke is what should happen when the boilers are turned off at Con Ed. What happens is Con Ed has to turn off their generating facilities when they don't get outside power. They, they can only generate power in the same order of magnitude as they are receiving from outside. When they get none from outside, there's no place for the power to go. They shut down their boilers. They were done to the best of their knowledge with no damage whatsoever. When that procedure is done, you tend to get some thick black smoke coming out of the stacks. That's exactly what people saw. There is, let me repeat again, no evidence whatsoever of terrorism. Sir. Uh, you indicated that the, what was luck we'd have power tonight. Did you get any indication from Con Ed about, I mean, is there a reason for you to believe that other than hope? Uh, no, no, power is starting to come back from the various facilities. The power generation capacity of Con Ed and of most power facilities, maybe all, because we still don't know exactly what happened in Canada, is intact. It's just once all of this shuts down, it is a very complex and time-consuming process that has to be very carefully choreographed to bring it back up. That is starting to take place. It is very encouraging. But I don't want anybody to think that the power is going to be back for everybody in the next hour. It is not going to be. But sometime over the, the next few hours, 
in a sporadic way, people will start to have the lights go back on, and it would be very helpful if people kept the Listening in on the uh, mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, addressing the cause of the large power failure in eastern North America. We're going to continue with network coverage. A couple of points locally. No power failures in the Maritimes connected to this. And Nova Scotia Power, Envy Power on standby to provide power if necessary. Flights are not leaving for points west, and some which were airborne may have returned to maritime airports. So if you discharge someone at the airport earlier or are expecting someone in tonight, you will want to check with the airport to see the status of their flight. Some pay TV and other services are being affected by all of this. We are going to continue with network coverage, the latest from here in the Maritimes tonight on Nightside at 11.30. I'm Steve Murphy. The mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, calming everyone, saying that uh, this is not about terrorism. This is, in fact, a massive power outage affecting all of New York City, uh, a lot of parts of New York State, and also, as he explained, up into Canada. He doesn't know what the situation is here. We can tell him large parts of Canada without power at this stage. Uh, we are uh, coming to you from a darkened studio. We, too, are on emergency power here. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to recap for you what's been going on uh, since we came on the air. For those of you joining us now at uh, just after 6 o'clock Eastern Time, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, uh, there it is on the map. All of these cities affected, Toronto, Ottawa, Detroit, Cleveland, New York. If you placed a square facing northeast right across that grouping, uh, you would find that uh, that power outage affects about 10 million people uh, in various parts of the eastern seaboard. Uh, Montreal has power. That comes from the Quebec power grid. And all parts of Atlantic Canada have power, as, of course, uh, do Western Canada. And further south in the United States, uh, we are told that Chicago has power. Uh, the, the outage was caused by um, a Manhattan power plant. Uh, a power grid was destabilized. And uh, this affected everything throughout this entire area. And uh, Byron Lee, who is with the Federal Agency, uh, Energy Regulatory Commission in New York State, says the thinking is that a fire at a generating plant in Manhattan destabilized the grid, which cascaded up the grid and took a loop around the Great Lakes into Canada. Now, that Con Ed facility is on 14th Street in Manhattan. Yes, there were a lot of concerns earlier that uh, certainly this could be a result of terrorism. Uh, several people have told us, uh, all sorts of authoritative sources have been quoted up to this stage, beginning with the New York State Authority and others, saying this is not about terrorism. Mayor Bloomberg making the point that all evacuation facilities are working well in New York City. Uh, people are cooperating. Everybody is calm. Uh, there are no injuries to report, no injuries that are known of at this stage. 